it has to be said that Anthony Burgess was really rather priapic. He loved whoring, and especially in Southeast Asia. He was determined when he went out to Malaya to enjoy the varied sexual resources of that region. And he writes quite extensively about his whoring experiences in his autobiography, in the first volume uh, of the autobiography, which is called The Confessions of Anthony Burgess, volume one. Here are just one or two excerpts from his experiences of harlotry in Southeast Asia. He writes... I had better say a little now about lovemaking in the East. A Malay female body, musky, shapely, golden brown, was always a delight. Malay women rarely ran to fat, which was reserved to the wives of the Chinese tokays and was an index of prosperity. Malay women were seductive, as few white women are. My experience with Chinese girls was mostly, alas, commercial. Prostitutes, or dance hall girls, knew all the postures, were thin, live, lithe, sinuous, but they were disappointingly uninvolved in the act. Kuala Kangsa, like other eastern towns, was full of Chinese women who went around in sexual sororities. They were aware, in their age-old wisdom, that only a woman can give a woman satisfaction, and that multiple congress is more ecstatic than a duel. Chinese men, so Chinese women seem to believe, were not useful in bed. They deemed it sufficient to have a long-lasting erection, And there were Chinese medicines around, usually with a high lead content, which ruined the prostate, but contrived a hard and unproductive rod. The few Thailand women I met in northern Malaya enjoyed Congress as a laughing game and experienced quick and happy orgasms with little help from the male. It was the Indian women who, as one would expect from the serious Sanskrit amatory manuals, disclosed most knowledge of the techniques of inducing transport for themselves and their partners, of renewing desire more times than the frame seemed capable of, of relating enjoyment to strenuous athletics, and of leaving the male body a worn-out rag tenuously clinging to a spiritualized sensorium, open-eyed to heaven. I had sexual encounters with Tamil women blacker than Africans, including a girl who couldn't have been older than twelve, but none with Bengalis or Punjabis. Whatever her race, the Southeast Asian partner's allure was always augmented by the ambiance of spice from the spice shops, the rankness of the drains, the intense heat of the day, the miracle of transitory coolness at sundown with the coppersmith birds hammering away at tree trunks and the fever bird emitting its segment of a scale, sometimes three notes, sometimes four. Ah, sex in the West is too cold, too unaromatic. There was enough commercial sex around in the towns of Malaya, but there was a certain discretion of display. The secondary exploitation of it in stage shows or blatant underwear advertisements was mostly abhorrent to the Eastern mind, though there was a famous Chinese striptease performer named Rose Chan who drew crowds of tokays panting under their binoculars. It was the white woman who was expected to be shameless and provocative. 